CBS Double Feature. Oscar nominee Susan Sarandon, Rob Schneider, and more tonight on The Late Show with David Letterman. Now, your local news. This is WABI-TV, Channel 5, Bangor. Good evening, everyone. We have reports that the bomb squad has been called to 13th Street in Bangor again. Craig Colson will have details from the scene. And the Winterport Fire Department says goodbye to their commander-in-chief. Creighton Parker has lost his battle with cancer. Well, it looks like cold weather is going to return after a couple of spring-like days. Waterville hockey team advances in the Class A Hockey High School playoffs. Bruins and Celtics both were winners tonight. Those stories and much more are straight ahead on Nightcast. Now, Craig Colson, Jenny Sperano, Chris Ewing, Tim Throckmorton. Now live, this is Channel 5 News Nightcast. First tonight, there appears to be another bomb scare on 13th Street in Bangor tonight. Police and the bomb squad apparently were called in on Monday where they found a bomb-like device underneath the car. Craig Colson is standing by live at the scene. Craig, does this seem to be a repeat performance of Monday? It does. It's a very similar situation as yesterday, Jenny, here on 13th Street. As you can see down there, police have cordoned off the entire area. They've evacuated residents as the bomb squad has moved in. Evidently, some kind of a device was found at a home at the same home as yesterday. Right now, we're joined by Sergeant Bob Bishop of the Bangor Police Department. Bob, what's going on right now? About approximately two hours ago, we got the call from the family that they found something underneath one of their vehicles. And they notified us, and uh, when we arrived on scene, it looked suspicious enough that we called in the, the bomb squad and began evacuation in this area. What's going on right now as far as the bomb squad? Of, of course, they have a certain protocol they have to follow. One of them is distance. We've set up a 600-foot radius right around the, uh, the location right now. And uh, they've got a lot of work to do, and it's very slow, meticulous work. It takes them a lot of time to go in and do this stuff very safely. Yeah. I imagine it's too early to tell if it is an actual bomb. I understand yesterday they had to take it apart and send it away to make sure of what it is or identify what it was. Right. They'd sent that evidence away to a laboratory. The same thing they'll do with this one tonight. Okay. Thank you for joining us, Sergeant Bishop. Well, evidently yesterday the, the home in question was a witness in an arson case, and, and they told Channel 5 yesterday that it was somebody that was trying to scare them out of testifying. That's really all we know at this point. The bomb squad is here on 13th Street. They've cordoned off the area, keeping people away from the scene. We will remain on the scene and we'll have an update as soon as it becomes warranted. Back to you in the studio. Thanks, Craig. In other news tonight, Winterport Fire Chief Creighton Parker fought many tough battles during his 50 years on the department, but lost his toughest fight today. Parker died at the age of 75 years old this morning after a long struggle with cancer. He will be missed by the many people whose lives he's touched and remembered as a caring man. Craig Colson had this report earlier tonight. Since he joined the department back in 1946, he helped make it the modern department it is today. Parker wore many hats during his lifetime, everything from a grocery delivery person to a deputy sheriff. But it was fighting fires that was his real passion. Assistant Chief Stan Bowden worked with Parker for the past 30 years. I met Creighton as a fire member, and uh, a good fiery fire member at that. Yeah. He had a good strong will. Uh, he had good leadership back then. He shared his personal life along with his professional life with us. Uh, it worked out real well. Department, pretty important to him. It was his whole life. Whether it was assisting a fire victim or controlling an accident scene, as we saw him here last April, Parker was most at home wearing his turnout gear and his unmistakable white hat. He remained on the job until his cancer became too much last summer. He won't be forgotten. Bowden says Parker had tears come to his eyes recently when the town named the department after him. I will tell you, we're all very proud, and uh, he's going to, I think he's left behind some good people to uh, continue on. It's going to be uh, more than a chore to, for any one of us to try to fill his shoes. That's not the intentions. We're here to continue on his good work. 
Visiting hours will be held at the Hamden Funeral Home this Friday from 2 to 4 p.m. and from 6 to 8 p.m. Funeral services will be held Saturday at Hamden Academy at 1 o'clock. The remains of a Vietnam soldier are coming home to America more than 25 years after the war's end. Captain Jack Duffy had been missing in action for years until his military ID card was found in a museum in Hanoi. His family has long accepted his death, but they say finally being able to give him a proper funeral will help them bring closure to their loss. Doug Cook has our story. This is beginning to bring, bring the finality to it. Uh, the realization, yeah, it's... After more than a quarter century, Bill Duffy can begin the closure associated with his brother's death. Captain Jack Duffy died in a plane crash in South Vietnam 26 years ago. Since then, the family has kept his memory alive with snapshots and newspaper clippings. Finally, his remains are on their way back home. It will, I'm sure it will feel like it, you know, it just happened and, uh, and will be a... Uh, was affected, to, affected by it then as we would have been 26 years ago. Captain Duffy was a respected Air Force pilot, earning his wings in no time. To Bill, he was Jackie, the little brother he learned to look up to. He was valedictorian in Poland High School, very smart kid, a bright kid, uh, was accepted to the Air Force Academy, and set some goals and achievements and, and, and just took him on. So he had, Jackie had dedication and motivation that even his older brother Bobby and I, we never realized he had. And, and as it was like he, he, passed, he passed us like we were standing still and then overnight we became extremely proud of Jackie. And the Duffy family is proud to arrange a service at Arlington National Cemetery. I think the, the honor of Arlington is something you can't pass up if you're entitled to it. And, 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 uh, and with a military uh, funeral that uh, he's entitled to, well, I just think it's, it's a great honor. A great honor for a man remembered as a great brother, a skilled pilot, and a brave patriot. Captain Duffy's remains will be taken first to a military mortuary in California. The family is planning to hold the funeral service at Arlington National Cemetery this October. In other news tonight, Searsport residents are reeling now that the state has backed away from the Sears Cargo Port project. Governor Angus King pulled the plug on the cargo port today, saying federal regulations had become outrageous. Elizabeth Williams with the story. The basic principle of poker is you got to know when to hold them and you got to know when to fold them. And one of the places you always fold them is if you discover that the game is rigged. So right now we're folding them, but we're not walking away from the table. Governor King officially announced the state will stop pursuing permits for a deep harbor cargo port on Sears Island. The port project was conceived about 20 years ago, but has been a battle between environmentalists and business people ever since. Governor King said the battle for the port had become an endless series of jumps through regulatory hoops with a price tag no longer sensible. Residents in Sears Port that we talked to today were angry by the news. I just all think it's a crock of baloney. <laughs> I don't think they know what they're talking about, basically. Do you personally know of anyone that was strongly opposed to it? No, everybody I knew had really high hopes that it would, would go through and would come in. The head of a major support group of the Port Project says most opponents are out of touch, out of staters. They just frankly don't give a damn about the economy. To them, the environment is more important. Governor King says the project will be back on the table when federal regulators get a grip on common sense. Elizabeth Williams, Channel 5 News, Searsport. In other news tonight, the two flight recorders from the Boeing 747 that crashed off the Dominican Republic were finally retrieved today. A U.S. Navy robot found the black boxes at a depth of about 7,100 feet. Investigators hope the flight recorders will explain why the plane crashed, killing all 189 people on board. The boxes are being flown to the National Transportation Safety Board in Washington, and authorities say some of the information from the recorders may be available within the next few days. Meantime, the White House and Congress are in agreement on a new crackdown against Cuba. The new sanctions are aimed at limiting foreign, foreign investment in that country. The bill would let U.S. citizens sue foreign investors who use property that's been confiscated by Cuba. The new sanctions are in response to Cuba's downing of two U.S. ships over the weekend. 
Mental illness was the topic of discussion during a Senate hearing in Washington today. Senator William Cohen is a member of the Committee on Aging. Cohen says the public needs a be to better understand the effects of mental illness. CBS newsman Mike Wallace was among those who testified today. He described a battle he fought against severe depression. But above all, a feeling of bitter and unrelieved despair and thoughts of suicide, contemplation of suicide, contemplation of the fact that maybe if I could just get out of here, the pain would come to an end. Senator Cohen says new advances in treating mental illness are needed in order to reduce the cost of long-term care. Back at William Cohen's Bangor office today, a woman continued her battle to find her son's killer. Young Joan's son was murdered in Baltimore two years ago. She has gathered signatures from folks in the Bangor area asking the Baltimore police to continue their search. I feel very warm right now, and I really appreciate it, the people in our community because I really don't think anybody care. And now I do believe in. Jones collected more than 1,600 signatures. Staffers at Cohen's office said the senator would hand deliver the petition to Baltimore's commissioner of police. A 36-year-old Burnham man has confessed to raping a 10-year-old girl. Wayne Curtis pleaded guilty to two counts of gross sexual assault today. Curtis was a friend of the child's family and was babysitting the girl at the time. Police say he raped her on the campus of the Goodwill Hinckley School in Hinckley. It's back to school tomorrow for students at the Harmony Elementary School. The mess left behind from burglars has been cleaned up. Police say the robbers broke into the school sometime last night or early this morning. The head custodian found broken windows when he arrived to work today. The police were called in and evidence that could link the, rob the robbers to another burglary was found. We feel that the break this morning could possibly be tied into a stolen pickup um, that occurred at Perrin Brothers and Smith uh, in Brighton uh, last night, uh, early this morning. Uh, Police say about $1,000 worth of damage was done to the school. Police continue to search for the vandals who ransacked, ransacked an Old Town Cemetery last night. Dozens of grave sites were destroyed on the Binock Road. It happened in a secluded part of the cemetery on the Orno Town Line. About 30 headstones were broken in all. Police won't say if they have any suspects tonight. The midshipmen at Maine Maritime Academy have a new training ship tonight. The Patriot State sailed into casting today where she will stay for the next few months. She's a steamship with a single propeller, and we think she will accommodate nicely the 250 students that will be on cruise this summer in her. The summer training cruise will take the students to the southern U.S. and Central America. The Patriot State is only on loan to the Academy. She will be replaced next year when Maine Maritime gets a new training ship. Time now to turn to Chris Ewing to see what's coming up tomorrow morning in our weather. Ah, well, it's going to be chillier than it has been the past couple of days, Jenny, and the winds will be picking up out of the northwest as a reinforcing surge of Arctic air pushes down from the northwest. In fact, we can take a look and see how cold it is across the country at the current time. About the only real mild spot would be the extreme southeast. Notice down in Jacksonville right now the temperature is 65. It drops uh, off as you head north as you might expect to the 30s around New York City. 20s across much of northern New England and then you head west from northern New England and look at portions of the northern Plain states, northern Rockies, uh, upper Midwest temperatures in the single numbers above and below zero. Cold spot back in Montana right now with a temperature already at 16 below and that cold air is working eastward but we should see a fair amount of sunshine and with uh, the uh, sun, get, sun getting so much higher in the sky this time of year than say a month and a half or two months ago we won't feel quite as strong a bite to the uh, wind tomorrow as we might have maybe a, a month ago. The forecast when you wake up in the morning, variably cloudy skies, that Arctic front still pushing through the area. It'll be windy, there'll be maybe a few flurries around here and up in the uh, mountains a few snow showers. In fact, a few inches of snow could accumulate in a few isolated spots tonight up in the mountains. Temperatures when you wake up will range from the upper single numbers to lower 20s from northwest to southeast. Jenny?
Thanks, Chris. When Nightcast continues, Lady Diana's days as princess are numbered. She has filed for divorce from Prince Charles. And it seems like some people in China will do just about anything to get into the record books. Their story is ahead tonight. But first, we will have all the day's sports news. We'll check in with the Red Sox as they begin spring training. Tim, what's going on in sports? Hockey. Boy, you know, last night it was fun watching the Class B games uh, in, up at the Alpha. And tonight down in Lewiston, that's where the uh, big school's playing. Class A, Waterville hockey team beat to NYA 43 tonight and 4-2-3 tonight at Lewiston. The other semifinal game was won by Lewiston, 7-4 over St. Dom's. The winners, the two winners, will play Saturday in the championship game in Class A. Bruins back at it in New York. Uh, Bees taking on the Rangers right off the faceoff. No scoring until the second period, and Ray Bork opens it up with that slap shot, 1-0. Two and a half minutes later, great passing, and Rick Tockett makes it 2-0 Bruins. Boston never trailed in this one. Rangers brought within one, though. Bruce Driver throws one home after New York's 24-game unbeaten streak at Madison Square Garden. They've now lost three in a row. Bruins three, Rangers one. Michael Jordan and Charles Barkley were fined, each fined $10,000 by the NBA today. The two skipped a media session before the All-Star game to play golf together. Celtics, for them, uh, Hornets having a, a better season but uh, losing tonight. New Maine men's basketball team left for Delaware today. Black Bears will play Vermont on Saturday night in a quarterfinal game. Three wins to the NCAA tournament. We've come a lot further than people thought we could. Uh, we're playing a team that uh, we, we've beaten twice, so we've got a, a legitimate shot. And we've beaten every team in the conference, so except for Drexel. So we think that, uh, you know, if things fall into place, we could have a legitimate shot at winning it. Sixteen teams gearing up for the Class A basketball tournament, which starts on Saturday. No Hamden players have participated in the event before. I spoke with a couple of Broncos who were practicing at the auditorium today. I've never been here before, this being my senior year, you know, it's, it took so much hard work for our team getting here. And our team is just so different this year. That We're pretty excited and I, think, I don't think the floor is an issue anymore. And it's just how we play and how we come out and if we want it more than the other team and if we play to our potential. We'll televise all those games on Saturday. Jose Canseco has missed a few days of practice this week, but when the season starts, the Red Sox will be counting on him. This year he'll be out in right field and not just a DH. Gordy Hirschheiser with the story. There's no dispute in what Jose Canseco can do with the bat, as he's one of the most powerful and feared right-handed hitters in all of the American League, if not all of baseball. But the 31-year-old, who has been primarily used as a designated hitter over the last two years, has been plagued with injuries over the last five seasons. We have no set schedule right now. Basically, we're just going to go on how the arm feels. And I know I'm going to try to be out there as many days as possible, but I think uh, number one key is trying to keep myself healthy this year. Back in July of 93, Jose had reconstructed elbow surgery on his right elbow after he pitched against the Sox at Fenway, an injury that changed his role with then the Texas Rangers to DH. Then last year with Boston, he was again a designated hitter. But to remain with the Red Sox, they told him he had to use the leather. For that. Taking a lot of fly balls, taking balls uh, left and right, uh, hitting the cutoff man, which is very important, uh, getting him back to the infield as quick as possible. Uh, I'm just trying to make uh, some accurate throws. Jose, out in right field, should be interesting, to say the least. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Well, tomorrow's our leap year day, and then we get into March. Is it going to come in like a lamb or a lion? Uh, March Madness. <laughs> <laughs> He's referring it back to basketball. Oh, I'm going back to basketball. Some basketball, yeah. right. Well, it may be madness by the uh, weekend. We don't know. There's a possibility of some storminess. What we do know is it will be turning colder over the next couple of days. We'll be back in a minute. Closed captioning of Channel 5 News is made possible through a partnership with Bangor Ear, Nose and Throat and Acadia Hearing Center. According to our live viewer net, down in the Benton Elementary School in Benton right now, the wind is blowing out of the northwest at about 12 to 15 miles per hour. 
and the temperature is 32 degrees. They had 13 one hundredths of an inch of precipitation today. Variably cloudy skies across the northeast. We've got another cold front sweeping through. It is producing some snow flurries and snow showers. Wouldn't be surprised to see an inch or two accumulate through some of the higher elevations of the foothills and back into the mountains overnight and tomorrow morning. Temperatures dropping into the 20s around here. Some 30s to the south. Hey, it got up to 56 degrees down in Portland today when the sun came out. But uh, that'll be a... Just a memory by tomorrow as winds, gusty northwest winds, will be transporting colder and colder air down across the area. In fact, we can see that cold air lurking off to the west of us. And again, winds will be bringing it down in our direction as it slides off towards the south and east. The storm system that brought us the unsettled weather now off to the east of us, but still some clouds along the east coast. Generally clear skies when you get back through Minnesota, back into North Dakota, and on up into south central Canada because there's a ridge of high pressure there now in the upper levels of the atmosphere, the jet stream is going to be taking, digging out what we call a trough here in the east. Arctic air spilling down out of Canada. The big question is, will the northern jet stream and the southern jet stream kind of get together and have a party along the eastern seaboard, allowing a storm system to move up in our direction over the weekend? We'll just have to wait and see on that. There are some signs that a storm will develop here, but head out to see. There are other indications that one may come a little closer to us, and that may pose some interesting scenarios around here long about Saturday night and Sunday. But in the meantime, just basically cold weather coming up. This trough moving through with a few snow showers and flurries, then Arctic high pressure building in. And that means some rather chilly weather around here. There is some snow shower activity off to the west of us and some rain down along the Gulf Coast as the Arctic front pushes southward. Here's the snow shower activity as we put the clouds or the radar into motion. We'll notice it working off towards these, most of it hanging around the Great Lakes and getting stacked up in the mountains. This is where the heavier precipitation is down along the Gulf Coast as that cold front continues to sag southward rather slowly. Now during the day tomorrow, we will see a mixture of sun and clouds in the mountains, mostly sunny skies elsewhere, a few flurries or snow showers in the mountains, but around here just a slight chance of a passing morning flurry. Gusty northwest winds will make temperatures in the high teens up north to about 30 at the coastline feel somewhat colder. During the day on Friday, we will have plenty of sunshine, high pressure building in from the west. That should allow temperatures to climb into the uh, 20s to around 30 degrees. And with that sunshine out there and the wind's not all that strong, it'll be a pretty pleasant day. We'll see you in a minute with the forecast. All right, let's take a look at our forecast. A small craft advisory is flying out over the waters. Northwest winds will gust over 30 knots tonight, and they'll continue out of the northwest tomorrow and west at 15 to 25 knots with a few higher gusts. Seas running about uh, 3 to 5 feet tonight, 2 to 4 feet tomorrow. Visibility good. Look for light freezing spray. The forecast calls for variably cloudy skies. It'll be windy. A few scattered flurries around here. A few scattered snow showers in the mountains. Temperatures up north as cold as the single numbers. While along the coastline, it'll probably drop to about 20. Winds out of the northwest, still gusting to 25. Partly to mostly sunny skies, a few flurries north and mountains tomorrow. It'll be windy, temperatures mid-teens up north to as warm as 30 at the shoreline, but feeling colder with those winds, still gusting to 25. Tomorrow night, mainly clear. Uh, as winds die off, temperatures will too drop to the low teens at the coast and as near zero inland, and then uh, cold weather Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, maybe some storminess late Saturday into Sunday. Okay, thanks, Chris. You're welcome. More news in just a few minutes. tell the town council what direction residents want to go in. Officials say an electrical problem is to blame for starting a fire at a Bangor apartment building today, and a neighbor is being credited with helping the residents get out. The building on the corner of Newbury and York broke out in flames around 9 this morning. A neighbor saw the fire and alerted the two people inside to get out. No one was injured. The building has extensive smoke and water damage. The fire has been ruled an accident. Shouting, we want our freedom, students in Oakland gathered in protest today. The students are angry about a school board vote last night that will allow police to search students' lockers and vehicles for drugs and alcohol. The group held a sit-in at Mesolonsky High School this morning and then took their protest outside. I believe that our cars are our personal possessions, either by us or by our parents. So I don't believe they have any right to search our cars. We think it's going to scare us and intimidate us and make us dislike police. 
if we have this big drug problem, where are the statistics? Yeah. Yeah. And we don't have any. There are none. It's about the dope in school. It's about our freedom, us being yeah. able to make our, our decisions when it's about us. It really has nothing yeah. to do with drugs. But Oakland police say the students are overconcerned. They say the school board approved a new educational program that would include lectures by law enforcement officers, police dog demonstrations, and searches if it becomes necessary. Police say they don't plan on conducting searches in the near future. They say the program is designed to help keep kids off drugs and alcohol. Now, this month's jet crash off the Dominican Republic is being blamed on a faulty speedometer. And that's the result of the investigation into the crash that killed 189 people. Officials say the faulty instrument told pilots they were flying faster than they actually were, causing the plane to go down into the ocean. The information comes from investigators analyzing flight recorders retrieved from the wreckage yesterday. President Clinton issued a warning to the Cuban government today not to interfere with protesters this weekend. A flotilla is planning to return to the area where Cuban fighters shot down two U.S. planes over the weekend. The president says he will also enforce a ban against any unauthorized trips into Cuban waters or airspace. Cuba says there will be no problems with Saturday's protest as long as they stay out of their territory. A routine bus ride turned a uh, routine bus ride to school rather turned deadly today in Missouri. A teenaged gunman boarded a St. Louis school bus and opened fire. A 15-year-old pregnant student was killed. Doctors were able to save the student's three-pound baby girl, but she is in critical condition tonight. The suspect fled the scene and is still at large. Police don't yet know if it was a random shooting or not. Meantime, a videotape that shows two Vermont police officers manhandling a woman was released to the public today. They had arrested her for driving without a license. The prison camera captured them forcibly restraining the woman, at, and at one point, one of the officers is shown grabbing the back of her hair. The two officers have been cleared of criminal charges but could face a civil lawsuit by the woman. Meantime, TV executives have announced they're devising a rating system for TV shows like the one currently used for movies. The rating system is a requirement of the new telecommunications bill signed into law recently by President Clinton. Elizabeth Caledon has details. The proposed rating system for TV shows is expected to look something like the system in place for movies. Violence like this might be rated R or restricted, something parents wouldn't want young children to watch. Details of the system haven't been established, but many of the TV executives gathered in Washington today agree it will be a complex process that could have a long-term effect. I think there'll be more Brady Bunch type programming and uh, less what we call cutting edge programming. It's gonna, I think it will have that effect in, in time. And, uh, but we're sailing into uncharted seas. The rating system would work in concert with the V-chip, a small computer chip that will be placed in new televisions. The V-chip would allow parents to program their TV sets according to how much sex and violence they'll allow their children to see. The new rating system will be devised by the TV industry, but it is not exactly voluntary. President Clinton's telecommunications bill signed last January mandates a TV rating system within a year, either industry designed or government imposed. The new system is expected to be in place by next January. Elizabeth Caledon, CBS News, Washington. Well, are you tired of paying taxes? A Monroe woman says she hasn't sent money to the IRS for 15 years because she doesn't like how it's spent. Bethany Howard has that story. Karen Mary's daughter refuses to allow her money to be spent on war. That's why she belongs to a group that opposes any taxes going to the military. Because I think there's a greater risk to pay taxes the way things are going right now than to not pay taxes. Even though Karen doesn't send her tax money to the IRS, she still fills out the tax forms to find out how much she does owe. That way she can send that amount to whoever she wants. For the last 15 years, I have taken all of the income tax money that I owe, and instead of turning it over to the government, I have given it to groups, uh, mostly here in Maine, who are doing the kinds of things that I think our tax dollars should be doing. Over the years, she's donated about $5,000 to those groups. She says the IRS has written and even stopped by, but so far, that's as far as it's gone. She says no matter what happens in the future, she will never allow her money to fund war. Bethany Howard, Channel 5 News, Monroe. The Yankee Day primary is still a few days away, but Maine students have already cast their votes. 
More than 120 schools participated in today's mock primary election. At Orono High School, Bill Clinton won the Democratic race, but for Republicans, the uncommitted choice came in first with 103 votes. Bob Dole finished second and Steve Forbes placed third. Um, there's no one strong enough to lead the pack. Saying a lot about the, the Republican candidates with 103 uncommitted, I think uh, probably the Republican Party feeling the same way. Nobody has a, jumped out in front yet, nobody's a front runner, I guess. Today's mock election was meant to teach students about the election process and encourage them to get involved as citizens. The warm weather has left some ice fishermen very unhappy tonight. Two ice shacks on Pushaw Lake in Old Town fell through late this afternoon. Game wardens say ice fishermen aren't required to take the shacks off the ice until about the end of March. But they say that they do say if you have a shack on the ice, it'd be a good idea to check it so you can avoid this misfortune. Yeah, so you cool. talk about your major bummers, huh? <laughs> talk about you your major bummers. Chris, kind of warm lately. That's probably a cause for that. Uh, I would say that's probably a fair assessment. You know, today temperatures were plenty cold enough out there with uh, highs only in the 20s around here and teens up north. And temperatures will remain rather cold over the next couple of days. But uh, again, we did have that warm weather. Speaking of temperatures, these are our projected highs for tomorrow. Highs will be in the 20s across much of the state. Oh, south of Bangor, especially down near the coastline, temperatures could reach the lower 30s. That would be the same down across southern New England. And then on Saturday, things may get a little more interesting around here. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. For the uh, wake-up forecast, plan on clear, cold conditions. Look at those temperatures. Not very warm. Lows will be uh, ranging from about 8 below up in the county to about 12 along the coastline about 6, 7 o'clock in the morning, and winds will be light for a change. Craig, Jenny? Thanks, Chris. We do want to make an announcement. Um, folks at the Waterville Junior High School will have no school tomorrow due to a flu epidemic, so that's good news for those who aren't sick and bad news for those yeah. who have the flu. A lot of that going around. I understand there's dozens of people out sick today. Yeah. So we'll have more on that tomorrow, perhaps. Well, the nightcast continues tonight. Former President Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union is aiming to get his old job back. And you'll meet one of Maine's leap year babies. But first, Tim will have all the day sports action. Winslow and Stearns battle on the ice for the Class B regional title. High school uh, hockey is winding down, Class B regional tonight. No question, Winslow is the best. And, and I'm not talking about Don Winslow, who Craig spoke <laughs> with earlier. He may be the best, <laughs> but I don't even know about He's the police officer. what he does. He is. Yeah. That's, yeah. I, I agree. He drives by where I live there. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, Regional high school hockey championships tonight. Time to pick up some hockey hardware for the school trophy case. Tonight in Orono, newcomer Stearns against old pro Winslow. Keith Erickson in the newsroom. Keith, that must have been a good one tonight. Tim, just two explosive teams. Number one, Winslow coming in with a bye in the first round. They knocked off Gardner in the second round. Stearns at number three. They're looking for the second upset as they took on Mesolonsky a couple days ago. They took them out. In the second period, Jesse McEwen had Stearns going. The senior forward Deeks, and he scores. Stearns nice into the lead. That made it four to two, Winslow. They're trying to be number one. They'll have to settle for number two in Eastern Maine. The loose puck, Eric Gunning to his brother Mark, does the pirouette, and he scores five to two Winslow, 13-18 into the second period. Then off the faceoff, Mark Gunning again collects his fourth goal of the game, six to two Winslow. Stearns scored four goals in the third to trail it by one, seven to six. But Chad Dubois makes it eight to six right there. And after their first round loss last year, they are now Eastern Maine champions the final Winslow wins eight to six over Stearns. This is the greatest. I, I won baseball in states last year, and th this is five times better than that. It doesn't even compare. It was a great win for him. We also played a great team. Stearns, he came back real strong, made a few more gray hairs, I'm sure. And Lee always has the lollipops with him to create that tension. Also, I want to mention that's the 1991. That's the last time Winslow had the state title. Tim, back to you. Thanks, Keith. This Saturday, they'll be after their sixth uh, title in uh, high school hockey. Western Maine, it was Scarborough and Falmouth for the title. And they're right to play Winslow on Saturday. 
Matt Bureau scoring for Scarborough there, and our producer, Cindy Smaha's parents and sister on hand as Scarborough wins it. Three to one. Sorry, Cindy, though. Scarborough will lose in the state championship game. Yes, that's a prediction. Winslow will likely prevail in that one. New York Giants running back Rodney Hampton has agreed to a six-year, $16 million contract. The Giants, though, have a week to match the 49ers up front. Babe, the Blue Ox now heading to the Hall of Fame. The name, the team contest information going to Cooperstown. The Hall of Fame is working to increase its minor league collection. Casey Arena, Greg Logan from UMaine, second team all-conference players named today. Also, John Gordon, the league's rookie of the year. Class A basketball tournament begins Saturday, and one of the top players trying to figure out if she'll be ready to play in the quarterfinals. Bangor's Katie Clark back at practice today, testing out her sprained ankle. She was taking it easy today and will rest it again tomorrow. The sprain was a week ago, and by uh, Saturday, Clark thinks she'll be ready to give it a shot. The Rams are getting ready to play Waterville. Two Waterville seniors made a, a deal before the season, and it's written in the team's program. If they make it to the tournament, they'll get down on their knees and kiss the auditorium floor. They made it, and they honored their commitment. This has been one of those dreams I've had my whole life from coming here in 85 and watching everyone. It's just a feeling of it. It's a great atmosphere. I'm nervous right now just being here, but I think it's going to be a great feeling. I'll remember it. It's forever. worth it coming here and kissing the floor. Then. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Good. Bangor Waterville game is uh, the 8 o'clock game on Saturday night. We'll start at 8 in the morning. We'll have already been going 12 hours by the time those two teams line up. And they made good on Full their bet. Yeah, they did. They were right there. It was a little dusty there in the corner there. So, well, I don't know. Thanks, Tim. Okay. It looks like it might be a good weekend to stay inside and watch some games, huh? Yeah, a good uh, weekend probably to uh, enjoy, sit by the fire, and of course in the furnace, or <laughs> yeah, not in the furnace, right. in the wood stove. That or might hurt like a little that. bit. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'll snuggle, and snuggle right. up. Yeah, exactly. We'll have our forecast when we come back. <laughs> Closed captioning of Channel 5 News is made possible through a partnership with Bangor Ear, Nose and Throat and Acadia Hearing Center. Well, right here in Bangor, right now, we have clear skies and a temperature of 13 degrees. The winds, which were gusting to about 35 around 5 or 6 o'clock this afternoon, now down to 6 miles per hour and continue to diminish. Let's see up at the Opal Myrick School currently if the winds are dying off. And yes, they are. They were running about four or five miles an hour just a couple of minutes ago. Right now, almost dead calm. Temperature, though, dropping off down to nine degrees right now. And their barometer is just under 30 inches. But it is rising as high pressure works in from the west. We have clear skies across most of the northeast. The winds are diminishing and the temperatures are dropping off. Single numbers up north right now, low to mid-teens across the south. Here's the satellite photograph. Notice the clouds down around the Gulf of Mexico. We'll be watching those over the next couple of days. High pressure back in the middle part of the country will be building in to give us some sunshine tomorrow, as we had today. The good news is the wind won't be nearly as strong tomorrow, so even though temperatures will only be a couple degrees milder, it'll feel like a much more comfortable day. We've got this trough dropping south and eastward with an area of low pressure developing, especially in the upper levels of the atmosphere. On Saturday, we'll also be watching an area of low pressure take shape down in the Gulf of Mexico, already producing a band of rain along the immediate Gulf Coast, and then not that far to the north and west, we're seeing some mixed precipitation. Looks like a storm will develop down in here, move up to the Carolina coastline Saturday morning, and then track northeastward. How intense it gets and how close it comes to the coast will determine whether we see just a little light snow here late Saturday or whether we see a more substantial snowfall. Doesn't look like a blockbuster storm, but I think probably a, a few to several inches seems like a good bet at this point in time. Again, it's still fairly early. We are seeing on the radar quite a bit of rainfall along the immediate Gulf Coast. And again, the northern fringe of this is cold enough to be supporting some snow and sleet. And it looks like even parts of Dixie will be getting uh, oh some snow and sleet from northern Georgia through South Carolina into the western mountains of North Carolina. And then the storm system will turn the corner and start sliding off towards the north and east. So during the day tomorrow, this is what we're looking at. High pressure off to the west of us, slipping eastward. That'll give us a westerly wind, mostly sunny skies. It'll be chillier. 
The wind should be running about 5 to 15 miles per hour, not that howling wind today, which was gusting to 35 and almost 40 miles per hour at times. Temperatures tomorrow still a little below normal, but not too far. Highs will range from the low 20s up in the county to the low 30s along the coastline. Clouds will start to filter in to uh, parts of the mid-Atlantic states tomorrow, but we should enjoy sunshine throughout the day. Then during the day on Saturday, though, the clouds will be rolling in. They'll be thickening up, thick, thickening up, not thickening up, that will be thickening up. We're having a tough night tonight. We'll have winds starting to turn on shore as the storm system starts pressing off towards the north and east. And then again, the big question is, does that storm system come right up through the Gulf of Maine or does it take a track a little further to the east? In fact, one way of looking at it is to uh, project where the track will go. We'll have one storm system passing down, kind of an Alberta clipper, more of a reflection of some energy in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And then the storm system, which is just taking shape in the Gulf of Mexico, will move uh, to the south of Atlanta by tomorrow evening. By Saturday morning, we'll be just south of Cape Hatteras. And by Saturday afternoon, southeast of Cape Cod. Again, if it intensifies rapidly after that, we'll see a moderate to heavy size snowstorm. If it takes a track fairly quickly to the north and east and doesn't intensify that much, then it would probably be a fairly light snowfall. We'll just have to wait and see on that. High temperatures tomorrow will be fairly chilly across the northeastern part of the United States, 20s and 30s. We'll detail the forecast when we come back. All right, let's take a look at our forecast. Small craft advisory is flying out there. Westerly winds will be diminishing to 10 to 20 knots, though, later on tonight. Winds will be out of the west and southwest at 10 to 20 knots tomorrow. Sea is running about 1 to 3 feet. Visibility good. Look for light freezing spray. The forecast calls for clear and cold conditions up north, temperatures will be between 0 and 10 below, and across southern and central areas between 0 and 10 above, winds will be diminishing. During the day tomorrow, we'll see mostly sunny skies, not nearly as windy, with a light to moderate west to southwest wind. Afternoon temperatures in the low 30s at the coastline, and 20s inland will feel fairly comfortable tomorrow night. Mainly clear skies, then increasing clouds towards dawn on Saturday. Temperatures ranging from the low teens around here. Single numbers up north and maybe a little below zero way up in the northern part of the county. The extended outlook calls for thickening clouds, or thicking clouds as we say <laughs> in technical lingo on Saturday, with some snow developing late, ending early Sunday, fair cold weather on Monday. That's a technical term, a meteorological term, <laughs> thickening. You can call it what you want to, Chris. Okay, Thank thanks. Thank you. We'll be right back. Well, we've just received word about a terrible plane crash in Peru tonight. Officials in Peru say a Fawcett Airlines jet with 117 people and six crew members aboard crashed while en route to the southern Peruvian city of Arequipa. An airline spokesman says that Boeing 737 was reported found crashed five miles from the, the city, but the condition of the crew and the passengers is still unknown tonight. The jury rendered a guilty verdict today in the James Jordan murder trial. Daniel Green was convicted of first-degree murder and robbery in the killing of Michael Jordan's father. The defendant showed little emotion as the verdict was read. Green could get life in prison or the death penalty when he is sentenced next week. Well, the O.J. Simpson civil trial has been postponed until September to give attorneys more time to prepare. Attorneys for the families expressed disappointment about the long delay but said it couldn't be helped. Meantime, O.J. Simpson resumed his media blitz today, calling a Los Angeles radio station. Simpson used the radio time to defend himself from the accusations that continue to surround him, and even took the opportunity to plug a new videotape. Well, O.J. Simpson's former defense lawyer, F. Lee Bailey, has won another round in court, this time keeping himself out of jail. An appeals court is giving Bailey a temporary reprieve from a six-month contempt of court jail sentence that would have started tomorrow. Bailey was due to report to jail unless he could immediately turn over millions of dollars in cash and stock he says was payment for defending a convicted drug dealer. The government says the money is part of the convict's seized assets. Former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev is looking to get his old job back. That story leads our look at other news making headlines tonight. Gorbachev announced his candidacy today. It will be a tough road to the presidency, though. His approval rating remains in the single figures. Gorbachev was ousted from power in 1991. Elections will be held in June. 
venga la poli ya. Meantime, 29 people were killed and 18 injured when a bus collided with a car in Spain today. Witnesses say the bus caught fire and exploded. Survivors were seen escaping with their clothes in flames. And what started as a routine day at an AIDS clinic in New Orleans turned deadly today. A masked gunman opened fire, killing one person, and then walked out. He is still on the loose tonight, and police haven't determined a motive. And imagine heading out to sea on a cruise ship, only to realize the ship can't make it back to land. A British ship was midway through a round-the-world cruise when it lost power. Two tugboats had to tow the luxury liner to a Philippine port today, but most passengers were able to continue the cruise aboard other ships. A day like today comes along just once every four years. 1996 is a leap year, giving us that rare day, February 29th. And it's a day that one couple from Maine won't ever forget. This morning, Steve and Stacy Thistlewood welcomed little Devin into the world. Stacy says she was afraid this might happen, having a baby that would only have a birthday party once every four years. Well, another fear I had was that, you know, little kids, when they want to show everybody their birthday on the calendar and his won't be there you know i hope he doesn't feel left out or something like that you know like where's my birthday it's the 29th and it's not there this year or something you know well the proud parents say this just makes their son that much more special they say on non-leap years they'll just celebrate devon's birthday at midnight Otherwise, he might miss a few we presents. And Huston, uh, college basketball coach Warren Crusoe and his wife had a baby boy this morning, too, on oh, leap day. Great. Yeah. And these babies will never have to worry about lying about their age. This when they're 100, true. they're still 25, officially. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> and a bit of snow on the way. Yeah, it looks like uh, some snow. Not tomorrow, not tomorrow night. Probably not uh, Saturday morning, but probably by Saturday afternoon. Probably some snow around here. Doesn't look like a, a monstrous storm, but we'll keep an eye on it. Plenty of time to get ready. That's right. All right. And that is the news. Thank you for joining us. I'm Craig Colson. And I'm Jenny Sperano. Good night.